It says live. I guess we're live. Hello, chat. Hello, Roger Ver, legendary Bitcoin investor. First guy to do a lot of things. Has a lot of Bitcoin. Owns Bitcoin.com or has a ton of influence at uh, Richard Hart here. Thought leader, lull, just a crypto longevity self-help guy. Want Bitcoin to do really well. Uh, I set up a structure for this here debate. We're going to be first uh, talking about things we agree on, which is a lot. Then uh, I'll try and steel man his argument, present the best version of it I'm capable of. And then uh, if he's satisfied with it, then uh, we can go on to, you know, the disagreement stuff. So Roger, you're a libertarian. You like voluntarism? Yep. Uh, I, I prefer the word voluntarist to, to libertarian since lots of libertarians in the U.S. aren't actually libertarians anymore. But uh, I'm a voluntarist in, in the sense of uh, you know, Murray Rothbard and, and those sorts. All right. So I think we agree on fungibility, uh, the right of one person to transact in commerce with another person without a bunch of third parties getting in the way, injecting their nose where it doesn't belong, uh, you know, creating misincentives, mall incentives, overregulation. Uh, I think we're both against those things. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I think ninety percent of what we talk about. I think all of our end goals are probably almost identical, and we just see different means to achieve those goals. And we probably just disagree on the means to achieve those ends. That's that's where I'm guessing this is going to head today. All right. So, what else? We believe in uh, living in nice places, and uh, I guess promoting our beliefs. We both have strong beliefs, and we go about promoting them in public. So. I guess we uh, were kind of advocates for the things we believe in. And I used to do martial arts, but nowhere near as cool as what you've done or for as long. So I guess that's the extent of our easy to find agreements. So I'd like to try and steel man what I believe are your arguments that I've heard uh, recently above and beyond those ones that we just uh, went over. Would that be all right with you? Can I present yeah, what I think go, your go arguments are? Okay. Go for it. And if it's okay, I'll, I'll jump in if, if I hear a part where I disagree with. All right. So uh, Roger Ver was one of the first investors in uh, the Bitcoin space, one of the first evangelists. He's gotten a lot of people into this ecosystem. He's offered a lot of liquidity. Uh, I believe he still holds a lot of equity in companies in the Bitcoin space. And from what I hear, he owns a lot of Bitcoins themselves, which means that uh, he truly cares. He has skin in the game. And, uh, you know, he's been out there giving talks and dedicating his life to this for a very long time. And he interacts and debates with people that uh, they aren't out there promoting the public as much as he is. They don't use Bitcoin to transact as often as he does. They don't remember what it was like when fees were so low to is you would never, ever even think about them. And, uh, you know, this system used to be a lot more decentralized. Uh, everyone ran a node because you could mine on your CPU. So you would just run the node at the same time that you were mining on your CPU. You know, there was 30 plus thousand nodes. Now I think there's under a thousand or whatever it is. It's some not large enough number to support the 50, 60 plus billion dollar market cap of this system. So what he's seen over the I'm years. Sure it's, it, it's more than 5,000 nodes that accept okay. incoming connections and probably tens of thousands that, that don't accept incoming connections. Yeah. And then we'd have to subtract all the ones that are controlled by the same central party through AWS, which we don't know how to really discount all of those that are like centrally controlled by the same guy. It'd be like, instead of having multiple newspapers, you just have more copies of the same newspaper. It's important to have geographically redundant and game theory redundant differences in your nodes, I think. So I just looked it up. There's 9,240 nodes that accept incoming connections. And then I, there's probably somewhere in the order of 10 times that that don't. So. I wonder how many millions of dollars of equity that is per, per node. What's a <laughs> Quite a bit, billion yeah. divided by 9,000? Makes you wonder. So, you know, I thought that, well, I won't go into why I think more people should run nodes. But if you own Bitcoin, shouldn't you run a node? Shouldn't you want the ecosystem to work? Shouldn't you want people to be able to download the chain faster, you know, from a good, honest connection that you operate? So what Roger's seen over the years is, uh, you know, the old guys that used to develop the software, uh, they stopped. Satoshi stopped. Uh, Mati Malmi stopped. Gavin Anderson stopped. Mike Hearn stopped. 
And they kind of stopped before they stopped. Like Mike Hearn really didn't even work on the main Bitcoin. He worked on his own kind of J implementation of it. It, it was different. Um, and if you look at the commits, even Gavin, he worked a lot more on theory than he did on like figuring out writing code at some point. So now there's a whole bunch of new guys in charge. And I think from Roger's perspective, he's concerned that they don't understand the economics. They've had disagreements with Mike Hearn and Gavin Anderson, uh, unresolvable disagreements to where there was a split. You know, Gavin uh, went and did a lot of testing and said he tested up to 20 megabyte blocks and it worked fine. So it, if you're not a technician and you're not doing the research yourself, you got to decide who you're going to trust. Are you going to take the word of the guy that's been there from the beginning and spoken and worked with Satoshi? Or are you going to trust these new guys? New guys that apparently don't hold enough Bitcoin, uh, don't incentivize the people enough, have a misunderstanding of economics, want to see full blocks, uh, think, tried to pump a fee market, say that fees are good, uh, which has hurt the user experience, slowed everything down. And, uh, you know, and they apparently, they appear in, in effect to kind of look like they're colluding with our, uh, with Themios and Bitcoin talk and, uh, Bitcoin Reddit with, uh, not letting Roger get his, his position out there that, uh, so I, I, if I can j jump Go in ahead. on one part there, so I guess in regards to the censorship, I'm, I'm not upset that they're not letting me get my position out there because I have a loud voice. I have a loud platform. You know, I have about a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. I can get my opinion out. The people that I'm really upset with are the people that aren't me, and they're just somebody on the internet who have an opinion, and their posts will li literally be deleted uh, from our Bitcoin or Bitcoin Talk if they post something that's not towing the party line. So, I have a loud voice. I can get my opinion out there, but everybody else isn't able to with the with the you know moderation policies that are that are going on at the moment. So. But yep. uh, overall, you've done a great job steel manning my position, so please great. feel free to continue. All right. So high fees, uh, disagreements with the original devs regarding the feasibility of things that may bring fees down, economic theory complaints regarding the desire for full blocks, uh, censorship. Let me think. I think I think I got it. I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Um, I, I think you got it pretty well. Maybe I can clarify a little bit where my, my biggest fear comes in. And my, my biggest fear at this point as someone that's a holder of Bitcoin and you know the CEO of Bitcoin.com and someone who's poured my heart and soul into this for about seven years now um, is that we had the formula that brought Bitcoin from zero to one, from absolutely nothing to, to this amazing ecosystem that it is today. And that formula within the last year has intentionally been changed. Uh, and that formula was letting the blocks get as big as they need to be and keeping the fees low and the transactions, you know, all of them would be confirmed in the very next block. And that brought Bitcoin from nothing to, you know, 10 plus million users. And now we have a group of people that are actively trying to change that code for success that we know for sure works because we have, you know, the entire history of Bitcoin to prove that it works. And maybe their new plan of full blocks and high fees and, and the fee market and all that maybe it will work uh and in their theories they think it will work but we don't have any real world data to back that up whereas with the with the previous roadmap we have years and years and years of empirical evidence showing that it does work and it worked amazingly well and so i'm terrified changing away from something that we know works and works incredibly well in favor of something that that might work but then again it might not and there's you know billions and billions of dollars on the line so that's that's what really scares me is the veering away from something that we have lots and lots of empirical evidence for that works and works incredibly well to something that might work or, or might not work. And in theory, I think it, it's less likely to work, to be honest. But even if I give them the benefit of the doubt that the theory works, we don't have the empirical evidence to back that up at all. And I would much rather go with a system that has the empirical evidence and, you know, I don't know, nine year long track record now uh, of success than with something that doesn't have, if anything, it has a negative track record at this point. Bitcoin's been losing a huge amount of market share. Uh, since the blocks became full and the fees became high and the transactions became long. So that's, I'm that's where my biggest that up fear Because is. that is the first thing on my list because I got a little list Okay, here. perfect. So I believe that the actual use cases for Bitcoin currently are insanely small. Newegg used to accept it. They stopped. Wikipedia used to accept it. 
they stopped. There's an airline that used to accept it, they stopped. More large companies have stopped accepting Bitcoin than have started. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. I mean, even I people that- the timeline was for the ones that stopped? Uh, I think they might have tried it out for a year and then gave up on it, more or less. I think most of them stopped around the time the network started to become congested and people started having a bad user experience because you didn't know when their transactions were going to be confirmed. Well, I know for a fact Wikipedia stopped because they A-B tested it and got less donations because of confusion, That's which is true. reasonable. And they, and they restrict a lot of the other payment methods they could accept as one of the largest websites on the internet um, you know, for that reason. So Bitcoin has a lot of problems. It has bad user interface. It has no retail marketing. It has uh, insane. Sorry, I would disagree on the no retail okay. marketing front. So in 2012, right. I set up BitcoinStore.com, which was the first uh, website in the world to start offering big items, uh, consumer electronics items for sale for Bitcoin. We had uh, around half a million items for sale, most of which that were about the same price or even less than Amazon.com. And in our first year, we sold more than $4 million worth of merchandise. Uh, and that was back in 2012. And uh, the ecosystem is much, much, much bigger than that now. So I think that there is a lot of commerce that goes on with well, Bitcoin. And it might not just be right there in front of everybody's well, face if, if they're not using it. But I, I would disagree with the point that there's not much commerce going on. Well, my point wasn't that there wasn't commerce. It's that there wasn't marketing. So we have a tragedy of commons problem. You may have advertised for your retail website, but you weren't promoting general Bitcoin ads. These pump and dump ICOs I'd that like have margin. Disagree. Again, okay. so I paid for national radio ads on more than 150 radio stations across the United States for mm -hmm. like six years straight promoting Bitcoin in general. And almost all of those ads were actually promoting Bitcoin.org. Uh, and so there was a huge amount of that. And I wasn't the only one doing things like that. There, were, there was a lot of action like that. But uh, Well, I mean, either would you like to see there more? Would you like there to be more marketing? I'd like there to be more marketing for a product okay. that's that's actually useful for people. And at the moment, I'm I'm worried about the the utility of Bitcoin. Okay. I think is well, we can uh, we can skip past Bitcoin's problems if you want, and shift to the fork stuff if you want. Um, I, I don't want this to turn into a six hour long <laughs> podcast, but well, I'll give you, uh, I'll I, give I you think... a list of the things I have here, and then you pick which ones you want to play with. Okay. So here's what we've got. I think that uh, most people don't use Bitcoin for the currency case as opposed to the store value case because you'd break your neck to try and find someone that it would accept it. It's very, very hard to spend and it's very, very hard to buy. So it's much better just to sit on it and watch it shoot to the moon and get rich sitting than it is to effectively pay eight times more for anything you ever used because now you don't have those coins, you spent them. Like anytime you use Bitcoin and you don't replace them, you feel really bad when you realize you spent eight times what you needed to because you didn't replace them. Right? So that's a good argument to replace the Bitcoins you're spending every time you spend them. It is, but people are lazy and sometimes they're afraid to buy in at four and eight X higher numbers because people, you know, think there'll be a reversion to the mean. So yes, people spend your Bitcoin, ask people to accept them, replace them if you do spend them. So here's my list. I think the reason Bitcoin price dropped in it didn't drop on its own. It dropped in relation to other things that appeal to other people. Bitcoin has always appealed to libertarians and uh, free thinkers. And another meme came out with the Kumbaya world computer social justice warrior thing. And they're different vertical markets. And Bitcoin was known to these people and wasn't appealing to them, but world computer was. And now that world computer meme that the social justice warrior types love is promoting pump and dump ICO crap and is the network which all the pump and dump garbage is being released on. The reason that this space is considered frothy and overvaluated is because of those pump and dump ICOs that are running on an ecosystem which is not Bitcoin. And having lower fees in Bitcoin would not have affected that market cap ratio whatsoever. So the reason so that we I have- jump in there? Yeah. So um, it's worth pointing out that Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, wanted to build it on top of Bitcoin and would have built it on top of Bitcoin if not for the, the current core dev team telling them, you know, get the heck out of here. You're not going to build it. We're not going to increase the block size. We're not going to make room for this sort of thing to be built on top of Bitcoin. And if that had been allowed to be built on top of Bitcoin, 
all of that economic activity that we see happening on Ethereum would have been happening on Bitcoin instead. And that's a direct result of Bitcoin not being allowed to scale to keep up with consumer demand. Now, this is the first part in the argument where we're going to have to get actually technical. You guys are going to have to be a little bit technical for this part. Roger just stated that it was an economic loss for Bitcoin that Ethereum didn't launch on it and tie its liquidity into it. And he is probably correct on that point. However, there's a technical point which makes his liquidity point not useful. And that is the Ethereum network is down often because they use a blockchain and the blockchain fills up just like ours and it fills up faster because they have larger blocks and so there's literally a competition to shove your transaction into the new ico as a miner before you let actual normal retail people in so that you can get the coins before they run out so there's already front running going on in ethereum mining there's already full blocks going on in ethereum mining and there's already millions upon millions of dollars being lost to gigantic attack surface in Ethereum. And I am glad that the poison and problems and bad design decisions that Vitalik and his crew made, which are unrepairable, I might add, multiple consensus implementations, implementations from different software languages from different teams are very much more likely to fall out of consensus than a single software implementation. It's very hard to write one thing that doesn't have bugs it's exponentially harder to write two and more things that don't have bugs. So, so if I can jump in a little bit there, if that's right. So yeah, um, there, there were, I guess, two points there. So you were complaining about the miners in Ethereum colluding to get their transactions in ahead of other people so that they can do whatever. Uh, that exact same thing is happening on Bitcoin right now because the blocks are full. Uh, mining pools and wallets like BTC China uh, actively say, okay, people that are transacting with our wallet will include your transactions first in our blocks that we mine with our pool. Uh, so that exact same thing is happening on the Bitcoin network right now where people are front running other people's Bitcoin transactions. You can now pay with credit cards to have your transactions included with a block because it would be too expensive to pay with the fees with the Bitcoin if the initial fee wasn't high enough. Uh, in regards to the multiple implementations, yeah, definitely sucks. Uh, in regards to the multiple implementations on, on Bitcoin, I'm sorry, on Ethereum, as compared to one monolithic implementation on Bitcoin, maybe, maybe not. But if you have one bug with the monolithic implementation of Bitcoin, then the entire network comes crashing down. If you have one bug with a, you know, one of four implementations on Ethereum, then a fourth of the network comes crashing down or forks off. And But that's worse. I guess it's, that's worse. Having, having Is a fourth of it yes. forking off or compression down worse yes, than 100% of it? Yeah, it's like writing a book and then you make an edit and then you don't remember what you edited and you have to search through the whole book to see what got screwed up. But if when you write to the, like if, if you can't write to the book anymore and you have to wait and there's only one copy of the book, like it's, it's basically versioning, right? Like the reason that you don't write software with just Word documents is because you have to keep track of changes and that's all blockchain is. It's something that keeps track of changes. So if you had a fork, like what you've described, technically a consensus failure is a fork. This thing doesn't say the same as that thing. And now an arbiter, a trusted third party, a powerful God has to decide which one is right and which one is wrong. So I agreed, I agreed up until everything at the point where you said in a powerful arbitrator or guard, uh, God has to, has to decide. I think the, the network and the users get to decide. And we saw that with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. There was a fork and one set of users went one way and another set went another. And there wasn't some, you know, God from on high that, that forced everybody to go in one direction. It was just yeah, uh, These the forks happen all the time. Them. They're called orphans. An orphan is the network deciding that what you thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. And it just goes away. It's a dead end. So when you mine a block and you have the longest block, and, and everyone agrees that's the longest block, but someone else had a good proof of work at the same time, but they got there a little bit later, their accurate, useful transactions that they decided on and fees they accepted, it goes and dies. So every single day in the Bitcoin network, every orphaned block is a version of the blockchain that never got to be agreed upon because it was decided on by the god of timing and the network consensus rules. What you've described I, I is a larger disagree. version of that. Go ahead. I said, I, I don't think we disagree. I think we're, yeah. we're on the same page here. So my point is that there is always something deciding that someone's idea of the future is not going to happen. Usually it's the consensus network. But if the consensus network fails, 
Then you fall over to social consensus, which is what you described in the F classic uh, example. And can we both agree that you shouldn't roll back the chain? Isn't that the whole idea here? Uh, philosophically, I think both of us are in favor of not rolling back the chain. And, and you and I think that that's kind of the whole point is not rolling back the chain and having an immutable ledger. But obviously a huge group of people disagreed with us and they rolled back the chain and then the current version of Ethereum was, was born from that. So you and I agree on that point, but lots of others disagree and we're perfectly willing to roll back the chain. And you yeah, know, it's all fun and game when you roll chain back the chain for you, but when the government makes you roll back the chain, you wish you didn't have the power. You know, there's a reason Satoshi stepped back and there's a reason Gavin stepped back. And it's because having the control to make changes it's comes dangerous. with risk. Because someone, a not nice person, will put a gun to your head and say, you know what? I want to double spend this exchange transaction and you're going to help. And that's the reason we need real distribution of parties is for censorship resistance. Because if Bitcoin doesn't have censorship resistance, what does it have? A very expensive database. That's it. We that's agree all. again. All right. So, all right. We believe in not rolling back the chain. We believe in privacy. We believe in security. Uh, let's go into. I'd, I'd love to hear you address my my argument in regards to that we have the empirical evidence and the, you know a giant track record of what works and has worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin, versus sure. going off on this theory. What? Yep, you could both be right, right and there's assessment. a timing problem. You're both right, and there's a timing problem. You could probably increase the blocks to two to four to twenty. You'd have more orphans. You'd have more centralization. There'd be more power in China. Large blocks are the reason we have empty blocks unless you know something I don't. Empty blocks come from spy mining. When you spy on other mining pools, as though you're a miner for them, but really you're your own mining network. And then you get the data a little bit faster and you start mining on the data that the pool gave you. But in actuality, uh, you're gonna like release that block on your own and hope it outcompetes the one that they're working on. But it helps you to outcompete that by not including transactions in yours. So the reason that we have literal denial of service attacks in Bitcoin, literal 10 minute periods where no transactions can occur is because of centralization. And that centralization gets worse the larger the blocks get because the more profitable it is to be geographically and uh, systematically commingled. So pools have done more to destroy the distribution of uh, censorship resistance in Bitcoin than anything else. Because when you mine for a pool, you don't run a node. You are the bitch of the actual pool that runs a node and they decide what the consensus rules are. And now you have no control, no say. You don't get to choose your developers. You don't get to choose what blocks are okay with you. You don't get to choose what transactions are okay with you. You do get to choose in the sense that you can choose which pool you want to mine on. Right, but how many pools are there that you can mine on that give you a variance that actually win a block once in a while enough, you see? So like, maybe, maybe a dozen or 20, some, somewhere in that ballpark. Not enough for $70 billion of value. Right, and so I think the best way to have, have more pools is to have more Bitcoin users with a, with a more vibrant ecosystem. And the more people that are participating in Bitcoin, the more pool operators there are going to be, the more miners there's going to be, the more everything there's going to be. And in the earliest days, you know, at one point, maybe there were, there were five pools total. And now we have, you know, 15 or 20 pools total that are, have, you know, more than 1% of the, the global hash rate. And I think uh, if the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole is allowed to grow, we're going to see an even larger number of pools uh, you got it in backwards. the future. You got it backwards. The Make maximum space. number of pools that ever existed was when everyone ran their own node and everyone okay. mined CPUs and GPUs. That was the maximum That's that fair. ever existed. And the more money and the more participants and the more value that we've had, the more centralization in China we've had. And you can't even negotiate with these guys. They're not on Twitter. They're not on Reddit. They're not interacting with me. They're not interacting with the core devs. They don't care to talk to you. They just care to run their mining software and have it auto flip from whatever chain is the most profitable. So even if you cared to negotiate with these guys, you'd also be having to negotiate with the logic of their auto flipping software, which is very risky for social consensus. Because let me tell you, the government of China decides one way, these guys are going to decide that way too or die. And do you want to risk the health of the Bitcoin network on the government of China? I don't. 
Uh, I'm much, much, much more concerned about the government of the United States causing trouble for people. The government of the United States has already thrown lots more people in jail for doing Bitcoin things than the government of China has. So I think our biggest fear should be from the United States government, not the Chinese government. And uh, just like the United States, there's lots and lots of people with lots of different points of view. Uh, China is an even bigger country with about four times as many people as the United States with a whole bunch of different viewpoints living all over the place. So I don't think it's fair to to group all of those people as if they're one monolithic entity. There, there's not. There's lots of people with very different views uh, within yeah, China. The same firewall. They're all behind the same firewall. And that I firewall think, introduces you know, latency. And so I, the government I think does that, have control of an internet network there and the power. You need a lot of power to run a lot of miners. And they decide what gets power and what doesn't. And there's some really, really interesting ways in which cryptocurrencies can be used to, to tear down that great firewall of China. And the Great Firewall of China is this, you know, giant drag on the entire world's economy and slowing the entire world's rate of economic growth. And I'm looking forward to, you know, myself and a number of other Bitcoiners uh, or cryptocurrency enthusiasts uh, using our technology to literally tear down the Great Firewall of China and make it obsolete. So that's, uh, I'm hoping one thing that we can agree on as well would be uh, good for the world. Yeah, someone should put up satellites in the uh, sky that beam the uh, blockchain over the firewall so it doesn't have to go through their, uh, their, uh, control <laughs> that would be nice yeah i hear so somebody might have been working on something like that yeah that's jeff an garzik, inside several years no jeff garzik uh, several years was working on exactly that myself and uh, eric for he's and a number of others uh, actually contributed some money towards that and i hear another company much more recently was uh, involved in that sort of thing as well yeah it's it's important that even if you don't like them you give them credit they got it done it works great and it's a great asset to the ecosystem so I mean, I'm going to call out the Blockstream guys for doing great work and not launching Vaporware and not talking, but launching and having a usable thing that real people are doing real transactions on right now. The core team are did that. Are people using it for, for transactions? Well, not a ton because it just came out, but anyone that wants to can. There are transactions that have been done on it. You go on Twitter, it's cool. So basically, you can receive the whole blockchain over uh, the satellite, and then you can SMS your private key out, and it's only like a few kilobytes. So you can use SMS to transmit. You can use blockchain to you receive. SMS the, 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 the signed transaction out, yeah. I assume yeah. not, not your private yeah. key, hopefully. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, sorry. What, what Roger said is no accurate problem. there. So you can literally use the blockchain and Bitcoin if the internet goes down anywhere in the world, like now. That's sweet. Good. Like, that's amazing. Until they block your SMS. Uh, transactions which governments yeah, but are... then you just can encrypt that, right? And you can make it look like a, a cat picture using stenography. And they're sure. not going to block your cat pictures. So, you know, the core team, they are the best at what they do. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm going to defend the core team here. Okay. Unless you want to talk you about the bad... With... Yeah, so your options, here's your options. We could talk about how bad the fork really is. We could talk about how good the core team is. We could talk about worshiping Satoshi and appeals to authority. We could talk about the community in RBTC. We could talk about your control over that community and becoming the next Themios, which is not very libertarian-like. We could talk about CSW and his uh, fake yeah, let, let, Let's pick one. Let, you choose, one. man. They're all good for me, dude. <laughs> like, sure. So um, let, let's, let's talk use the one that's best the... for the audience, I guess. I mean. Like you and I just is getting there, smarter. Is there a chat room where we can see what, what people want to talk about? Or? You're never going to want to read chat, believe me. You're not going to want to read chat. <laughs> okay. It's just going to be uh, I won't open not it a good in that experience. Case, so. yeah. um, let, let's talk about, I, I think, you know, deifying Satoshi and Satoshi's vision and this and that. Um, it's not that Satoshi's God. It's that we have, you know, eight years of empirical evidence that his system worked and worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin. Why wouldn't we follow on the same path that we know for sure works to grow Bitcoin to become incredibly popular all over the world. Why wouldn't we continue on that same path? So I think Satoshi is a sellout. And I think that he could burn his private keys now and not risk the future economy of the world with an unknown party holding 10% of it who may have given those keys to his kid and his kid might be the next Hitler. Or he may have gotten a mental illness and gotten wacky himself. Or he has some other socially dangerous beliefs and he decides to use the 10% net worth that he holds of the planet and whatever you gave him with the BCC fork and the coming B2X fork and the airdrops from Byteball and Lumens. And this guy's accruing a lot of money and he's a variable that we're unaware of that chose to get out of the game when no one else did 
right? He could just burn his keys. He I doesn't, call he him Lumen's head air drop so right now. Yeah, Lumen's good air drop. Yeah, I'm getting you <laughs> rich, man. Get notes. your Lumen's, get your Thank bite you. balls. You're welcome, bro. I think I'll give you a percent on the Lumen's. Um, so, you know, Satoshi could still be here if he was alive. He could still be guiding us. He could still be helping us. He could be renouncing his control of his keys, but he's not, which means he's either a bitch or he's dead. Those are the only two options I'm aware of. Now, as okay, far as so let, let's say let's say I can see to every point that you just made there, okay. um, which I don't necessarily do, but just for argument's sake, sure. um, that didn't answer my question at all. My my question okay. was: we have you know a nine year track record of exactly what worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin from nothing to where we are today, and that right. was having fast, cheap, easy to use transactions and let the blocks grow from ten kilobytes to twenty kilobytes to fifty kilobytes, all the way on up till one megabyte. And yeah. it wasn't until we hit the one megabyte limit that the adoption rate trailed off and Bitcoin started losing market share right. to competing right. cryptocurrencies and the user experience became horrible. So we have so, the empirical evidence with a nine-year track yeah. record of work, work well. Why wouldn't we follow on that same course? Why are we changing courses to so, something that may or may not work? We have no empirical evidence of it. I understand. Well, you're, never gonna, you're not going to have a lot of empirical evidence and uh, empirical evidence in crypto because we just got here. So we're working with limited empirical evidence on nearly any single thing that we do. This is all cutting edge stuff. And on the but cutting edge- We do have edge, nine years track record for, for how we grew Bitcoin sure. from, from nothing yeah. to where it is today. So you're cherry picking two things. First, you're cherry picking that fees are the reason other cryptos did well. Basically like robbing those cryptos of any other mimetic advantage or technical advantage or marketing team advantage. You're just saying Bitcoin had high fees and that's the only reason these other cryptos became valuable. If you so talk to, to be the fair, I, that, I think if I can add what exactly mm -hmm. my argument is, the fees are a side effect. What I think really caused the other cryptocurrencies to take off was when Bitcoin blocks became full, you no longer had certainty that your transaction was going to be confirmed. And the uncertainty of when your transaction is going to go through is an even bigger problem than the high fees. So I think you know, I get to see I, support I, tickets from lots of I, businesses. I wouldn't be surprised if you pumped the value of those coins. I mean, you you what, what coins? cash be brought into the world a twenty percent pre mined, in, impossible to detect inflation altcoin. You funded that, right? So, in so to some I, degree, I like yeah. And I, I can tell you the reason for that though, is the everyone's busy arguing over Bitcoin scalability and how to scale Bitcoin at the moment. But the big giant other problem that's looming for Bitcoin is fungibility. Uh, Bitcoin is not nearly as fungible as it needs to be, and fungibility is just another you know friendlier sounding name for anonymity, right? The more private Bitcoin is, the better the money uh, it is. And that's another area that's really, really lacking with Bitcoin. And small blocks make that problem worse. Uh, when governments or whoever are trying to search for transactions, they're looking for a needle in a haystack. We want them to be looking in a needle for in a great big giant haystack rather than a little tiny one megabyte haystack. So uh, yeah, they can't. that's another problem that's caused by yeah. small blocks. I, look, I, I agree with that. And if it wasn't 20% pre-mined, and if it had detectable inflation that you could detect if the coin broke, I would have been happy to fund it too. But you know, uh, those two things are deal breaker for me. Anyway, okay. so my, my the, point the is, nice part about crypto. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So my my point is, a lot of rich crypto guys are the reason that those things had a spike to make them interesting, to give other people in the normal public a reason to find them more interesting. Look, we both agree we want lower fees. So. Let's just talk about fees, right? Okay, because the, so, the core team disagrees with, with both of us on that, then if, if you're saying you want For a very fees. specific reason. So I said that you cherry picked the reason that uh, we lost market share. Now I'm going to say what that you're you cherry picking. Well, right now, all those other things don't perform any commerce functions. So if it was really a replacement good, as you advertise, then it would be used as a replacement. But Bitcoin shares no utility replacement value with the pump and dump ICOs. There is no retail adoption. There are no retail wallets. These people don't even take the coins off exchange. If the I think you're cryptos, conflating ICOs with other competing cryptos. And I'll, I'll give you an example from my, my own life. So there's a website called bitcart.io that I used to love to buy Amazon gift cards from, uh, mm -hmm. with Bitcoin. From, and that you would get a 15% discount for Amazon gift cards using Bitcoin. And as of, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, when the network became really, really full, they stopped accepting Bitcoin and they only uh, were accepting, I believe, Dash and Ethereum. And so that's a real world use case of businesses right. shifting away from Bitcoin to competing altcoins, you're, which I think are different than ICOs. Right. You're 100% right. 
the increase in fees prices Bitcoin out of a lot of markets. And even though you're 100% right, the amount of dollars and liquidity and pump that comes from actual retail darknet market usage and you, the number one Bitcoin user in the world's usage, is like 3 to 5% of the total market cap. So you're right. There, anyone that actually does do Bitcoin commerce, which is almost nobody, might have to really, switch to currencies. I really disagree that there's not many people using Bitcoin for commerce. And anybody can, can take a look at just how many people are using Bitcoin for commerce by going over to blockchain.info and watch the transactions scrolling by. Those are real people using Bitcoin to real, move real amounts of money around the world. And we don't necessarily know what they're using it for. But if you see it moving, there's some sort of economic activity going on behind it. Uh, at $5 a transaction or $8 a transaction, they're not moving it just for fun. They're doing it because they're performing some sort of economic activity with it. If you wanted to buy a car with Bitcoin, there was one company in the States that had scale. They went out of business. There's maybe one or two small like shops like near uh, Butterfly Labs in Kansas City. There was a shop that like accepted Bitcoin. There's maybe one in California, maybe one in Florida. Like I love Bitcoin as much as the next guy, but I'm not willing to pretend that it's not a thousand times less places you can spend it. And I'm being generous with a thousand. It's probably a hundred I think you're, you're really missing the, the picture. There's more than 200,000 merchants uh, in Japan that accept Bitcoin. I can walk down the street to the electronic store and use Bitcoin in the store. I can walk down to the street to the equivalent of uh, like Macy's or something in the US and spend Bitcoin here in Japan. Uh, there's all sorts of restaurants. There's all sorts of stuff. There's all sorts of websites. I book more hotels on Expedia in Bitcoin you know, than I can count each year. Uh, there's a huge amount of commerce that's being used uh, with, with the Bitcoin network. And the fact that it costs $8 per transaction to do it, and yet the blocks are still completely full, shows just how big of a demand there is for people to use Bitcoin in, in real world commerce. All right. So you think there's a lot of commerce. Maybe in Japan there is. I don't think there's a lot. We'll move on. Um, do you have a theory as to why people would be moving the you know bitcoins at eight dollars per transaction if they're not doing commerce with it? Why why are they spending eight dollars, uh, you know, every time they move bitcoin and it's well, because all it's the not, blocks are completely full? What are they doing if it's not commerce? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's the whole idea is we're not supposed it's to commerce. Know. People are using bitcoin to pay people all over the world, and. When the network became full and the user experience became not as good as it used to be with Bitcoin, people started exploring uh, alternatives like you know Dash and, and Monero and, and Ethereum yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and, and that's a direct result you know of, of there's Bitcoin other Bitcoin alternatives too, blocks. like Visa and Mastercard and Swift. Yeah, and right. people are using that sometimes now instead of Bitcoin, whereas previously yeah. they would have used Bitcoin. Yeah, so a real problem we, for, we for agree. We both Bitcoin. like to see Bitcoin fees be very low and that everyone accept it and use it. We're both on the same point, there, right? So you know the Blockstream team want the exact opposite. They openly say they want Bitcoin fees to be high. They want Bitcoin transactions to be easy to double spend. And they want the blocks to be full all the time, which leads to uncertainty as to when a transaction is going to be confirmed on the right. network. So you and I want the same thing. Yep. Those guys want the exact opposite. Why would you be supporting their roadmap for the future of Bitcoin? Because they're not a monolith and there's interior conflict amongst their ranks. Let me give you an example. Please. Uh, Greg Maxwell. He's all right with the one megabyte limit. Luke Jr., he's not. He says we only get 17% more processing per year, but the blockchain grows faster than that. So he wants to knock it down to 300. No one else on the team agrees with that, right? So Luke Jr. is on his own, you know, with tonal uh, numbering and uh, his 300 kilobyte and limit. Geocentric theory, or theory and a lot, right. he's on his own you know, with a lot of things. He's on his own with a lot of stuff, right? So the majority of developers do not agree with him on the, I won't say majority, but his most public controversial opinions, all right? Now. But I, I do think that for the most part, there's consensus among the block streaming core developers that they want to have a fee market right now that creates high fees. Well, I can explain it to you. I'm going, going to. Like, I've prepared for this. Okay, so, I'm ready. You are correct that you could have lower fees with larger blocks now. You would get more of the same problem, which when you cherry picked, you missed out on, which was the centralization what, what problem which is that? causing empty blocks. The centralization is the result of the block sizes being what they are. The so bigger they a, get, the more empty blocks like to, get mined and the more centralization like exists. 
So the empty blocks are actually just a way of the network slowing down so that everybody can keep up. So the reason an empty block takes place is one, one pool finds a block, and then the other pools that are spy mining on it, they see the header, and they can start mining on the header right away until they have received the entire block and they validated that block. Then they can toss a bunch more transactions in there and, and mine a block that has a bunch of transactions. So the fact that one full block is found here, and then you know two seconds later while spy mining, another empty block is found, the full block takes you know five, 10 seconds to validate. The empty block with just the Coinbase can be validated almost instantly. And the next block won't be found for maybe 10 minutes after that. So it right. slows down the entire network so everybody can kind of uh, keep up. So it's actually a way of making sure everybody can keep up with what's happening on the network. And I don't see it as a bad mm. thing uh, at all. That sounds like miners stealing money for pretending to do the work of verifying transactions and just getting paid well, the for only, nothing. The only other option is when one pool finds a block and the other pool hasn't received the entire block and hasn't validated it, is for them to not mine at all during that period. So rather than not mining at all, they still continue to mine. And if they find a block within, let's say, that 10-second window, they mine an empty block. So the only other option to mining an empty block is to not mine at all. And so I, I think it would be better for them to mine that empty block. From the, from the pool of minor rewards. If you're, if you're not performing useful work, you are harming the network. Useful, they're getting paid. That's still useful work because they're adding more work onto the tip of the blockchain, which makes the blockchain just that much uh, more difficult to go back and rewrite. Yeah, everyone, Roger has a mining company and he's apparently good buddies with a guy who makes mining equipment. I found that it's very hard to make these types of ethical arguments against biased <laughs> understanding. Make, make it again and I'll try to understand it because I don't think I understood where the, the theft was coming in. I think I heard you were, well, use the word stealing. Your, your, your model is that it's no big deal that this block happened because for some reason it's better that the network be slow. And then you also said that we're also going to instantly find another block at the same time. And I'm not sure that either of those two things is actually the case. And if those the two things these empty blocks are, are happening or 99% of the time is when it's found right after another block. Uh, and that's, if you look at these empty blocks, they're found at uh, almost identical time to another block. And okay. so that node hasn't received the full block and they're not able to mine on top of that other than just mining on the header. So that's why you're seeing these empty blocks. But someone's are getting paid to mine there. on a header when they could have just not, right? They could have not mined at all. That's the, the option. Right. Either they, they don't mine at all yeah, or they which, mine on the header for that 10 second period. I'm okay and I'll, with I'll tell you another. And I'll tell you another reason. So, like the Bitmain S sevens, for example, if they all of a sudden, when you know they have you know a thousand plus watts going into one of these mining machines, mm -hmm. and if the internet cuts off or they stop mining all of a sudden, they have a tendency to literally catch on fire and burst into flames, and that's a big, big <laughs> problem in a data center. So, just from a technical standpoint, it's not feasible yeah. for these machines to stop mining for those ten second okay. periods because you don't want them to catch on fire. And that sounds like someone that's involved evidence. with the data centers for these. Yeah, we uh, we try to avoid having fires in the data centers, uh, especially electrical compelling. fires. Yeah. So my my point is, you could be entirely correct, and Gavin Anderson could be entirely correct. And the network could operate with larger blocks now. And it would lower the fees for a while. And maybe if lower fees increased adoption, which I don't think is the case, um, then you you'd don't be think right. The lower we should fees do increase it. adoption? Did I did I hear you say that? Well, I think that we had a bunch of transactions on the network, and then they disappeared the second the Segwit 2x agreement was signed. And I think that someone, perhaps a miner, was just pumping transactions into blocks to make it look like we needed to have resolution immediately because it cost them less because the fees that they paid to mine those transactions into those blocks, they were getting on the other end anyway as block rewards and as fees on the other side. So to me, because of the timing, when those transactions disappeared, I don't believe that those were real transactions that were filling up the blocks. And let me tell you something else. You talk about how good B. I don't even know what you want to call it. You want to call it BCC, BCH, Bcash. You choose. Probably not Bcash. Are you serious? I thought everyone else loved Bcash. Only on the censored forum where there was a, a actual campaign. Oh, like the Dalnix, the head dev, like chose Bcash as a name and pushed it. You got to get that guy in line. I'll choose whatever name you like. What the? Uh, okay. Yeah. What do you want to call it? Bitcoin Cash sounds fine. Bitcoin Cash. Okay. So, Bitcoin Cash does 
these things, which you say are awesome. The blocks are empty. And when I say so empty, now, now I, I mean they're under mind. a hill. A little bit. Good. Okay. Well, I don't want to. Like, well, you don't you, like. You I, don't I think like you can feel free to cash? talk about Bitcoin Cash, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to give my own opinion and thoughts okay. about Bitcoin well, Cash. I retract my statement down. regarding uh, Roger's likeness or not of that thing. Bitcoin Cash is a hard fork of Bitcoin, which has really low fees because it has really empty blocks. The last blocks before this call were under a hill, 100 kilobytes each. And this is with an eight megabyte limit. And this is with blocks that are being found five to six times faster than they should be, just giving free money to the miners. So if Roger's right and transaction fees are the important thing, then you can use almost any other cryptocurrency in the planet because not that many people seem to be like attacking them. So they all seem so, to work pretty good. If so, I can jump in here. Sure. I, I think transaction fees are important, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing is the network effect and the amount of merchants and users and wallets and all this infrastructure built up around the world. And that's why the US dollar will be so incredibly hard to displace because there's all these banks and mobile apps and, you know, just uh, you know, cash registers and vending machines and just an absolutely staggering amount of infrastructure is already developed around the entire world to use the US dollar. Uh, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin has the most amount of infrastructure already in place around the world mm -hmm. for people to use it. That's an incredibly hard thing to overcome. Bitcoin Cash has been around for about three weeks. Uh, Bitcoin Cash changed the underlying economic code of Bitcoin with their emergency uh, difficulty adjustment thing that I'm, I definitely have some concerns about myself. Um, but I, I, I don't think my... it's the fees that's the most important thing. I think it's the network effect. So okay. go ahead, Richard. So hash rate matters, right? Because that's sure. the reason we don't have 51% attacks. Hash rate's what secures the network, yeah. All right. Well, the Bitcoin Cash fork, I'm going to say stole something like Two of seven to three of seven exahash. By steel? Can you define what you mean by steel in this case? Well, in this case, they uh, pretended to give a lot of people a thing, which when they went to dump it on market, they couldn't because they had to wait 20 confirmations, 16 to 20, unless you're on HitBit, then you could do it in two, which they accepted a huge risk because the chain could have got rolled back. So they dump this on a bunch of people, which also for some people in certain jurisdictions are going to cause tax consequences. And then if you weren't plugged into the internet at the time, you didn't know you were given this thing. And now you're being forced to make a decision as to whether to hold and by holding increase the economic value and by increasing the economic value, pay the miners to screw over the network that you'd signed up for. So when everyone got Sorry, these, I, I think I, Go, go ahead. When everyone got these free coins and couldn't dump them on exchange and couldn't drive the price to zero, it gave existing SHA-256 Bitcoin miners an economic incentive to leave and thereby attack the network that they were originally participating in, which was the real Bitcoin. So all the people that didn't dump on site the Trojan horse coins allowed the market value to float, gave the miners an incentive to switch, slowed down block times in Bitcoin, reduced security in Bitcoin, and this was done with a Wix website, a single developer, and some miners that were interested in profit. That's gross. That's bad. If a single developer with a Wix website and a single dev can steal half What's the Bitcoin What's wrong with the Wix power, website? Well, it's just another, another centralized point of failure. The Wix admin can go in there and change the download link for the wallet and steal everyone's keys. Which, by Isn't the way... true of, of just about any website hosting? Yeah, the but DNS most, can point to some other website that's a clone with you know malware for download. I don't think that's a yeah, problem and with the, and the That's more, just a problem with the internet, period. No, it's not. Because you, the more people you share the ability to write with, then you multiply your risk. So if you host with the same people that host your DNS, then there's one point of failure. If you host somewhere different than you host your DNS, now there's two points of failure. If you use uh, 2FA through SMS, now you've got SS7 three points of failure. If you don't do the administration yourself and you hire an admin, now you've got four points of failure and they just keep multiplying. So, so I think the a, fact that they used a Wix website is, is probably the, the, the weakest criticism of, of Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> I don't think you're going to find a lot of enterprise level multi-billion dollar projects launched on Wix websites. 
I think it is a huge security well, we problem and the one. inability There's of their developers. There's a reason they only have one developer. There's a reason their software is not working properly right now. There's a reason that it's hard for you so to hire good devs. There's not one developer. That's just an out, outright lie. There's but there's quite a few developers. Uh, there's a quite there's a huge ecosystem developing around it. I look at it. It's it's only been out for about three weeks, and it has what the third or fourth biggest market cap in the world at this point. Uh, the <laughs> fact that the blocks are happening, you know, are already 100 kilobytes, and they're happening a lot more often than than at once every 10 minutes. That shows that a lot is already happening on it. Oh, hold on so. a second. I, t I said that you liked Bitcoin Cash, and then you told me not to put words in your mouth. But now you're promoting the heck out of it. So I'm saying say that you stuff's like happening Bitcoin on Cash. Bitcoin Cash. So um, a lot of people think that I'm the one that pumped up the price of Bitcoin Cash. So I didn't I sell did. a single Bitcoin. No, you didn't, but a lot of other people have. No, I did. Um, I, I promoted oh, did you? that okay. idea too. Because why oh, wouldn't you? Uh, uh, I haven't. So the, um, no, you I, don't have to sell Bitcoin. Sold you could have sold your other altcoins to pump it. You could have sold I haven't cash sold to a pump single it. Bitcoin or altcoin or cash or anything for for Bitcoin Cash up until right. yesterday, and I sold like about a dozen bitcoins for some Bitcoin Cash because I had them sitting in, uh, in exchange. Okay. I wasn't quite sure what to do with them at the moment, so it definitely wasn't wasn't for okay. me. So. Well, I, I like that. I I I am happy to see that that wasn't you because I don't like the concept that. Someone comes along, steals brand awareness, steals literally. So I, I'd like yeah. to disagree with the word steal here. Okay. So, um, well, so let's talk about it with, with, with hash rate. The, the hash rate belongs to the miners and the owners of that mining equipment, and they're free mm -hmm. to do whatever they want with it. They can mine on Bitcoin Legacy. They can mine on, on Bitcoin Cash. They can you know, just turn it on to use it to heat their apartment and not mine anything if they want to. That hash rate belongs to them, and if they decide to mine on Bitcoin Cash with it, Nobody's stolen anything from 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 anyone at all. Um, so I, I would like. I don't. To I don't really to want to use the word steal, steal but I, I'm literally just short of words. Incentivized, maybe, is a more accurate. Okay. Word. Bitcoin Cash okay. is incentivized miners to switch from right. Bitcoin Segwit to to Bitcoin Cash. So let's so let's talk about the end result of this occurring. How would you feel if uh, someone came up to your Bitcoin.com company and said, "You know what? We're going to destroy your company because we don't think you're running it right." I know that you've been here for many, many years, paid dearly to, to put this up and build the things you have, but we think you're stupid and we're going to destroy your company. But you know what? It's not theft and it's not bad. It's not evil. It's just the free market because we're going to give you some shares in our new company. So you're describing exactly okay what Blockstream that. has done to Bitcoin. You're describing exactly what Blockstream has done to Bitcoin. We had the Bitcoin white paper from day one that described exactly what the, the what Bitcoin was. It's a chain of mm -hmm. digital signatures. And Satoshi said very clearly that the, the Bitcoin never hits a scaling ceiling. The ultimate solution is to let the blocks get as big as they need to be. And then Blockstream came in and they said, screw that. That's stupid. We Bitcoin doesn't need to be a chain of signatures. The block should be one megabyte and have completely changed the roadmap. So you can make an argument that the thing that you were complaining that Bitcoin Cash is doing is exactly what Blockstream has done to Bitcoin. They've completely turned Bitcoin upside down from what was outlined so in the your, original white paper so argument, was described by Satoshi. Okay. So your argument is Blockstream sucks and because B Cash, Bitcoin Cash did the same thing, they also suck. No, I, I think my argument is that anybody can advocate for whatever they want and they shouldn't use force or fraud to do it. And so, you know, if Bl Blockstream has been very successful in, in what they've done. You know, credit credit to them. See, you say that, right? You, you believe that people shouldn't use force. But I think you use force. So when you post... Put out the force to me, please. I will. So when you post on our Bitcoin, they don't want to hear anything about altcoins and they consider certain changes to the consensus algorithm of Bitcoin, altcoins. And that who, may be unfair. Say they, who is they? The moderators? Well, the moderators, yeah. Bitcoin? I mean, Femi yeah, because the users, the users don't get to decide. Their posts get deleted. When they start posting right. things about altcoins, the posts get yep. deleted. If, if yep. the users weren't interested in discussing those altcoins or those other things, they wouldn't mm -hmm. be posting on there to begin with. So I agree. you have from on high a bunch of people deciding what, what is allowed to be discussed and what's not. Yes. And you can post anything you want that's negative about Bitcoin Cash, and those posts are allowed to yep. stay. But if you post yep. anything that's positive about Bitcoin Cash, those posts will be deleted. So I agree. So you know, That's a fair so, moderation policy over there. You know what? You might be right. What I want to point out to you is that you are becoming the evil that you hate. You just don't realize it. So you're a moderator in RBTC. You're a moderator in RBTC, right? 
Have you ever read the website? Have you ever moderated it? If, like, did you go so there? So unlike our Bitcoin, our mod logs are completely open, and you right. can see every single moderation that I've ever yeah. done on our BTC. Right. And so it's the, probably less than a dozen actual actions, and I think right. like probably ten of the dozen were just me approving posts that had been deleted by the auto moderator of Reddit itself. Yeah. So I'm not my actively point, moderating. My that point myself. is that your end result of horrible ecosystem is the same, but the mechanism is different. The reason that the ecosystem Can you define sucks, horrible ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do all this stuff. I know I'm being mean, so I'm going to I'm going to say like exactly why I believe what I believe. Our Bitcoin is considered overly censored because of the reasons that you've described. And I'm willing to Do grant you, you those things. I, I don't like our Bitcoin. And I, I don't like it because of the over moderation. I don't like it because most of the participants suck. I don't enjoy engaging in conversation with the majority of people that I find there. I find Twitter to be a much more interesting, much more intelligent conversation full of people that actually run businesses, actually hold a lot less Bitcoin. going on. Right. A lot less censorship, a lot more good things going on, a lot more positivity. I like Twitter a lot better than I like our Bitcoin. And I like our Bitcoin a lot more than I like RBTC. Because your why. guys' problem isn't a moderation problem. It's a uh, tragedy. Too much free speech problem? If you, I've done this a couple days now. You guys are 25% pro-Bitcoin cash for a, a, a subreddit called BTC. So you're mistitled the subreddit now. You need to change the name to be accurate. You falsely advertise on Reddit, and I click these links that are clickbaity links, and they don't take me to the article that's advertised. They just drop me in the main subreddit thread. And you have pseudonymous uh, effective moderation through the fanboys that downvote things so far down that no one ever needs to moderate them out of vision because the fanboys do it for you. So maybe that's the up, general opinion of the people that are participating there. Yeah, but you can look, you can grow a garden of weeds and then you can say, you know what? Like we never have to protect our roses here because we don't have any, it's all weeds. And that's what RBTC is. I dare you today to go to RBTC and screenshot it and just categorize each post. Something like 7% is anti Bitcoin core. 25% is Bitcoin Cash, 10% is BCC, uh, another like 6% is BCH, and there's nothing about Bitcoin on the RBTC forum. There's nothing about, hey, this person adopts it. So there's nothing about, hey, how can I program this wallet? There's not a single good thing to be found in that place. Maybe so Richard, it's because everyone that's been censored has moved there, and you guys don't have to force it to be evil through moderation. It's just emergently evil, but I'm telling you, it's bad. So if you don't enjoy the, the conversation that's going on on our BTC, then don't participate. It's, it's that simple. Nobody's being forced to participate in that one. And I, I'm not very sympathetic to the criticism that allowing too much free speech is, is a bad thing. But it's uh, not free. There's a downvote button. And you just have the emergent... You but have the posts the don't disappear. The, the posts are still there. If you, you know the percentage of people that hit page down on a website, you lose something like 50% plus every time you have to hit page down. So I, I don't one. know about... Other people, but for myself personally, I love reading the posts that get the most that have been collapsed because of the downloads. Usually, those are the ones that I, I always click to uncollapse it, and I think, "Oh wow, this person really did deserve so, the downvote." A lot of times, so I, my mission isn't to like trash talk you. I actually have solutions to offer. If you believe censorship is bad because it starves people of the ability to make good decisions because they're starved of data, then it is important to one not moderate incorrectly, which apparently you already have covered. Congratulations. I like that. But two, you have to account for fanboyism and extremism and mob mentality. And you have to maintain the quality of your ecosystem by promoting things that are alternative points of view that kind of were anti the reason you started the whole thing in the beginning. Because for people to make good decisions, they need to see both sides. And on our Bitcoin, they don't see the big blocker side. And on our BTC, all they see is censorship, anti-core, and BCH. That's it. And that's not healthy. I think for those people. are incredibly important topics to the, to the Bitcoin. So we have a group of people that have come into Bitcoin that have engaged in this giant censorship campaign 
to promote censorship resistant currency and I simply don't trust anybody that engages in censorship to maintain Bitcoin as a censorship resistant network and I think you and I both view decentralization as the tool to achieve censorship resistance and with Bitcoin the goal the end goal is censorship resistance and the decentralization is simply the tool to achieve that goal and if this guy Thamos is going around on this big giant censorship campaign to promote what's supposed to be censorship resistant currency I don't trust that guy as far as I can throw him if he's willing to engage in censorship he's, yeah he's not going to protect Bitcoin censorship resistance the small amount of defense that I will give him is that if you want to read about altcoins Oh boy, you can read about all the coins, all the altcoins you want on the Bitcoin talk forum. So they didn't, he didn't perform the censorship there that he does perform I on our Bitcoin. In their own subsection on our Bitcoin, or I'm sorry, on bitcointalk.org. It's been a while since I visited, but I, I believe Dude, there's a subboard devoted. Every single ICO launch goes there first. Every altcoin launch goes there first. So they're not performing that censorship across that whole domain. They are performing it across our Bitcoin. But you know what? If you're tired of seeing people get scammed and you're tired of people seeing lose millions of dollars in altcoins, they're too stupid to understand LARG arguments. If someone goes to our Bitcoin, they really should not be reading about alts. And you know, I don't see a lot of Ethereum posts on your subreddit. So you do perform moderation there. No, we our mod logs are open. You can see anybody can post a, a post about Ethereum. If people want to upvote it and talk about it, it'll stay there. And you I'm know, sorry feel for free to go on over to I, I thought that. Yeah. Like every other forum, you guys would try and restrict it to the title of the forum and the rules. Most forums do. If you guys haven't been attacked by shills for other currencies yet, maybe this uh, is a bad conversation for us to have had because they're going to go test that now. <laughs> every they're, other they're crypto currency and, shill. And people can, can upvote or downvote <laughs> as they feel, uh, feel you know, see fit. All right. Um, so I just want to warn you that at some point you become the evil you're trying to destroy. You own Bitcoin.com. You mod RBTC, you're on television all the time, you're, you're hiring devs to do side deals, you're running your own conferences that have a subsection of people that has done weird things. So Gavin. I think if we can stop a little bit, I, I think you're straw manning me a little bit. So you can go okay. over to the forum.bitcoin.com and you'll, you can see that there's posts over there from, uh, I forget what his screen name is over there, but he's saying all sorts of nasty, rotten things about me and claiming that I'm, you know, Jihan's little puppet and this and that. And like his his posts are allowed to stay. His posts are still there. I don't delete no, his posts. The moderators don't delete that now. Posts. I'm saying you're at risk. That's all I'm saying. Sure. Saying that I, anybody that's the owner of a, a big popular website is a risk that I, I can't. But, just but a lot of Bitcoin.com. Right? I mean, you're in mining. Bitcoin.com gets millions of unique visitors uh, per week. I could go rogue like Thamos has already done and, <laughs> and has been a bad actor for years now. And so I, I hear you complaining that I might do something bad in the future. Yeah, start a foundation I think we like every other large entity did and let Thamos someone else... Just start a foundation and let it be someone else's problem. That's what Wikimedia did with Wikipedia. Yeah, I donated, That's, I think it was like 8,000 Bitcoins total to the Bitcoin Foundation, and that didn't work out so well for me. No, no, you get to choose the directors, man. Like, you get to choose the yeah. first group of guys. Like, I'm just saying, if you don't like centralization and you feel it's a risk to the ecosystem, and you don't like what Themios has done, and he might have turned out to be, you know, a great guy way back when, and the power corrupted him, I'm just telling you to be on the lookout for it. Because at some point, your bubble's going to get smaller, and you're not going to listen to as many people, and then no one's going to tell you, "Hey, you know, look what's going on." So that's fair advice. So I, I have a question for you, though. Yeah. Um, I, I hear quite a bit of hate for altcoins from you, or it seems like you're not a fan yeah. of any altcoin ever. Pretty Can much. you? Um, so I'll, I'll give you my stance, and I'd, I'd like to hear why you think I'm I'm wrong. So uh, in in life it's good to have more options. So in the crypto coin ecosystem, people can choose between, you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum and Monero and Dash and take your pick. There's a thousand and one altcoins out there. Most people just choose one or two um, and shapeshift.io makes it easy to convert from one to another. Um, but people have the option of choosing the one that's the most useful to them in their daily life. Uh, what's wrong with people having the, the ability to choose which coins they want to use in, in their daily lives? So this is the Darwinist argument. Darwinism and survival of the fitness and trying new things and mutation and you know It works awesome when you've got an infinite energy pool and you don't mind all the experiments that went wrong The problem with finance economics and human emotions Are that those poor sons of bitches that chose wrong because no one has enough time to learn about every alt Even me and I sit around a lot uh, It means that a lot of people are going to be ground up into the meat grinder 
for the experiment of, hey, maybe this works a little bit better. And so the libertarian- So what's the option? It's very simple. The libertarian argument always is, this locally works very good for me. And so I wanna take what locally works very good for me, an educated thinking, individual thinker, and now I wanna give that same power to the masses of less capable idiots of the world. And they don't realize that you can't take a local maxima and export it to people with different traits and expect the same outcomes. You probably benefit from having a wide selection of currencies to choose from, but you will find that not very many people are like you. And you have to choose between brutal Darwinism, where tons of people lose tons of money, but maybe better investors end up with it, and maybe the world is a little bit better off, this is the boom and bust cycle of artificially low interest rates. This is the boom and bust cycle of credit I, I from nowhere. I don't see those things being related. Well, how many times do you want to see people lose money to Ethereum? They can't even do a smart. They can't even do a multi-sig wallet properly. The so pre I, I wallet in space what, lost hundreds, at least sixty million dollars from a poorly. So what contract. are you suggesting, though? Should we make altcoins illegal? How would we prevent people from being able to experiment with altcoins? There's either Experts. they can experiment as they want, or they're no. they're not allowed to, or prevented. What what are you advocating should be done? just like every other developed industry, experts in the space that have a personal reputation to defend, like you, like me, like other people, speak their expert knowledge to influence the masses in directions that they feel benefit those masses and the ecosystem as a whole. It is up to us as thought leaders, people that have individual thoughts, experience, skin in the game, to help the idiots make the right decisions. Because in this bleeding, cutting edge system, a lot more people with these ICOs are going to lose a lot more money than anyone ever thought possible. These things are crazy and it will not last. And when that pain comes crashing down, you know who else is going to get harmed? The good ecosystem of Bitcoin people that didn't do that pump and dump crap. We're going to pay the price in regulation. We're going to pay the price in bad press because we didn't do a good enough job helping those people not get robbed. And by the way, the people doing the robbing, they're not even gonna end up that well out of it. Some of them will end up in jail. Some of them will end up with more money than they know what to do with. It'll be like winning the lottery for these guys. And if you've ever looked into lottery winners, it never works out well for them. Squander the funds, sure. So it's, a ba it's bad for the investors. It's bad for the people taking the money. And it's our job to help shut that shit down. I started coming out publicly when I saw Ethereum's market cap so can I ask, almost reach shit. When you say shut that down, Shut that down by Locked. speaking out against it or yes. by asking just, you just know, by speaking with guns wearing costumes to show up Hold and on, I lost my earpiece one sec. The price we pay for beauty. Wireless is convenient. Maybe you can't hear me yet, but all right. I can hear you. So um I was saying when you when you say it should be shut down. Well, you're what, advertising what you for Bitcoin Cash now, and I'm advertising against it. And this is that I am doing what I believe. I guess I didn't moral. make the question clear enough. When you say shut it down, does that mean we should send men with guns and wear, no. you know, costumes? Or no, this is more this is, no. Against it? no. This is more of the hey guys, you really shouldn't do that and don't come crying to me when it goes wrong. And when it does go wrong, I'm gonna say I told you so. That kind okay. of shit. I'm I'm on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean we can have a microcosm of that experience now with Bitcoin Cash if you want, because I hate it a lot. And I can go through all the reasons why I hate it. And then you can tell me if you are there any, with any of them. Are there any altcoins that you don't hate? Are there any that are interesting to you? Oh, sure. You know, Zcash is interesting. Uh, there's a fork of it that takes out the, the founder's reward, which is called Z Classic. That might be interesting. Implementing ZK Starks and Ethereum might be interesting, but the attack surface is too large. I'm pretty sure ZK Snarks are gonna come in Bitcoin. And I'm glad to hear you support that. That's amazing. Fungibility is super important, as you said. I love onion routing and the Lightning Network. Uh, I love drive chain side chains. You get all the experimenting, all of the changes, all of the craziness, but you tie all the liquidity back to Bitcoin. And there's less attack surface area. I love all that stuff. I think Monero has apparently some use cases, but you know, if it hasn't pumped by now, it probably never is going to pump. So I wouldn't be happy to dive right in. Uh, you know, I like the non-blockchain technology. Like, I like Byteball a lot better than I like Internet of Things. I'm a, I'm curious to see whether the distributed acrylic graph can replace these blocks, which do get full and only scale linearly. 
But do you have any is, more tips for me as far as uh, the coins that did airdrops that I can claim sure. with, with yeah. the coins? I took notes. Bite ball, sure. lumens, what yep. else do we have? So bite ball drops uh, once a month. You need to get in soon though, because they don't drop forever. Like they're running out of ones to drop. And then they just basically took a snapshot of the Bitcoin economy. And they said, whatever percentage you own of the Bitcoins of the world, we're going to give you the same percentage here. And we're going to do it every month. And then when they're running out distributing them, that's it. So you're going to probably get, uh, you know, one or 2% free money off the bite balls. And then uh, the lumens, I think you get like maybe half a percent free money. I haven't really looked into it yet, but the deadline's in two days. So definitely do it. And there's a new crappy one that came out called like Bitcore, but seems pumpy dumpy, doesn't seem legit. Um, Sell that's not, yeah, yeah. So I, I like... Uh, I like the idea that as a Bitcoin holder and owner of the premier currency with the most security, the best devs, the longest track record, the most wallets, the most adoption, you also get the most free money handed to you from these other altcoins that want to leech off the ecosystem or the users. So I, I, like, I, I like the thought of having the you know the longest track record and the best devs and the most security and all of this, but uh, I'm really, really, really concerned that we've gone completely off the roadmap that yeah. we had for Bitcoin so, that we so let me tell you the roadmap so the next thing in the hard the next thing in the roadmap was a hard fork to a larger block that was the next thing in the roadmap it yeah, was you up think to that's still going to happen here what, what, is, what are your I thoughts think, i think it's going to i think there's an infinite demand for free storage and i think that anytime you write something to the blockchain it gets copied to thousands of computers across the world by your last measurement about five thousand computers so if i could write 9, Sorry, that accept incoming connections and, and probably, yeah. probably around 100,000 that don't. Okay. So 9,000 that I can write data to, right? So the blockchain is stored on those 9,000 computers. If I write my YouTube channel videos to the blockchain for a low affordable fee, I now have my YouTube videos stored immutably forever across at least 9,000 computers. That's a good bargain for me. I think I'll stop using YouTube. So it is true that the demand for free storage is infinite. And so you have to assign a fee or you can break the network through denial of service, period. So the way that the prices are set are based on supply and demand, not somebody yep. sitting in a chair saying we're going to set a fee. So the miners can decide yep. what price they're willing that. to charge for inclusion in their block yep. space. And I right now there's a production quota imposed upon the miners saying they're not allowed to produce more than one megabyte of block yep. space every 10 minutes. And that's the exact antithesis of, of the free market. It's, right. it's literally a production quota. Here's the good news. While the, Bit, uh, the Bitcoin core people have been screwing over the idea which you like and probably could work of having larger blocks. It did work. We have a great track record. They also were working on stuff that also works and is cheaper and is faster and is a 10,000 no times track more record. powerful. And and has no empirical evidence and will also right. require much, yep. much, much bigger blocks for it to work. Lightning yeah, Network is a, is a disaster waiting to happen with full blocks. We'll see. It's right? cutting because edge. you can't close your channel out. If someone tries to do some monkey business and the blocks Why? are full and you can't close your Lightning Network out, you're going to lose your money. Why don't you get CSW and a supercomputer to go model that and produce a report on what happened when he ran the Lightning Network and how it failed? And then we can address it. Right? There's no you reason to like him on your show next time to speak for himself. So I'm I'm not I've, Craig's I've trash talked that dude a lot. I'm not sure he's gonna want to come on. Craig, if you want to come on and have a chat, uh I invite you, but it's not gonna be pretty. I like Roger. Roger's been a straight shooter for a long time. You I've heard bad things, Craig. If you want to come on here and, and here, get a mouthful, you're invited. It, see, it worries me, man, because like that dude talked at your show and Gavin got convinced he was at, a at show? uh the future bitcoin conference oh so that first of all that wasn't my show and i didn't know he was oh. speaking there until okay i don't know like the day it happened or the day before so i might be dreaming the stuff up but people run in circles right so i would be considered the block stream core small blocker circle uasf all that stuff right it's not because i've ever ran a node it's not because i wrote the software it's just the circle we run in. It's who we chat with, it's who we see, it's who we interact with. From what I've seen, you and John Matonis and Craig Stephen Wright and Gavin Anderson are like a little circle, and I guess Jihan Wu. Now, I might be wrong, but it, it seems like I see you guys at a lot of the same events, 
And I see you saying a lot of the same things, which are big blocks, good. And uh, basically big blocks, good. I, I don't really hear you guys say anything else. And censorship, bad, I guess. I mean, yeah, th I, I guess mean, I'm in pretty good, good company with, with John Matonis and Gavin Andreessen and Jihan Wu. And uh, for my interactions with Craig Wright, uh, he seems to be a really, really, really knowledgeable person and uh, a very interesting person. So. He was on TV saying he was Satoshi, and then he pr provided a fake ECD essay proof that he got busted on. And he's fled from Australia to the UK over some tax stuff. And he's been yeah, saying... Well, taxation is theft, so more power to him if that's the case. But my understanding yeah, is but, that that's not necessarily But the using case. the taxation system to steal from... The, to re-steal the theft. Like, like if the government steals from other people and then you steal from the government, you didn't steal back your money. I don't have to that, sure. Yeah, like... So... If you want to read, Anyhow, I, I don't know the details of that, and I'm not Craig's spokesperson, so I'll yeah. let him speak. But you see the risk on those topics, but you see the risk of the only people out there supporting a person that said he was Satoshi that I've seen are N chain guys, which I see around you, uh, Anderson, who so like in regards to to Craig being Satoshi or not. Uh, I don't think it matters at the end of the day. Either what he's saying in regards to scaling is accurate and correct and a good path forward, or it's not. And the things that I hear him saying are the same sort of things that the original Satoshi said on his posts on the forum and his emails. And uh, those are the same sort of things that I signed up for when I got involved in Bitcoin. Those are the same sorts of things that led Bitcoin to become an incredible success that it is today. And those are the same sort of things and the same roadmap that I think we should continue to follow down, uh, which is completely different. You know Satoshi wrote that one megabyte limit, right? He did that personally. Yep, because he was convinced yeah. by others that uh, it would be a good idea to prevent spam. And... Mm -hmm. uh, it was intended from day one that it would be removed if the blocks ever even became remotely close to, to being full at one megabyte. So it was never, ever, ever intended to be a permanent limit. Is it, is it probably worthwhile? Like, so I think the likelihood that you get people to use Bitcoin Cash is larger than the likelihood that you're able to convince all the developers on Bitcoin Core to do nearly anything. So I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. So like, like we could argue whether big blocks are good or not, but we're just going to find out soon because we have both now, right? Yeah. We have both running the same. Darwinism wallets. in action. Yeah. Okay. So can I tell you why I didn't like the way uh, Bcash went down and the downsides? I'm sorry, Bitcoin Cash. Sure. Um, I believe there's a lot of risk people don't please see. Please tell me, and then I, I'd love to finish up in maybe the yep. next 15 minutes because okay. it's almost coming up on 3:30, and I I'm haven't sorry, had any. Man. It's I love okay. Talking. I'll talk to you whenever you want. I'm a talker. Um. But please tell me. So Bitcoin Cash caused people to commingle their funds out of cold and actually, storage. Before we continue, I'd, yep. I'd like to, to point out the two. Like Bitcoin Cash caught me by surprise, just like it caught everybody else by surprise. So I didn't fund right. the development. And like lots of things in Bitcoin, I either get credit for or blamed for. Lots of things that I had almost nothing to do with. So uh, I'm I'm along for this Bitcoin Cash ride just like everybody else, but it caught me by surprise just like everybody else as well. So well, please, I'm please glad you cleared that up, man, because I, I think a lot of people out there thought it was your baby. Um, yeah, so I'm people, glad you cleared that up. I'll have to either blame me or give me credit for things that I had little or nothing to do with. But I'll tell you what, if you would respond to your Twitter commenters, you would know what they thought. I never I'll see tell you what, if you have 100,000 Twitter followers, it's hard to keep up with the, the, the infinite scrolling of stuff happening there. So I apologize if anyone feels ignored on, on Twitter. Okay. So my, my, my summary so far is be careful you don't have too much power. Power corrupts. It's anti-decentralized. Be careful about scammers. Read your Twitter comments if you can. I'll uh, try. And then you end up with emergent censorship from the bottom, even if it doesn't come from the top. Watch your garden in your subreddit. And, uh, and now we'll talk about forks. So you might not have supported this fork. You might support a fork in the future. I just want to talk about the risks of forks. A lot of people had a lot of unused coin days and age on their coins, a lot of anonymity, a lot of cold storage that was all harmed and destroyed because they had to go and load their coins into wallets and bring them back to life and uh, now to use them on another network. And they had to download a software that wasn't signed by a person with an identity that could be held to account if keys were stolen. And that so fork that's software, go ahead. That's, that's simply not true. So I think you're referring to Electron Cash yep. in regards to that, but there yep. were lots of other uh, wallet options for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, 
uh, there's, there's, I don't know, maybe almost a dozen at this point. So BTC.com's wallet supports it. Bitcoin.com's wallet will support it probably by this weekend. We've already submitted it to the Apple yeah. App Store, etc. Coinbase has announced now. support. Blockstream has announced support. There is mm-hmm. Bitcoin ABC. There is the Bitcoin Cash version of Bitcoin Unlimited. There is the Bitcoin Cash version of Bitcoin Classic. So like, there were lots and lots of other options other than Electron Cash. And the way in which Electron mm-hmm. Cash worked yeah. in which it would copy the, the, the wallet file into its own directory, like... Yeah, that's not good, and that would probably caught a lot of people by surprise. But don't it's use even, software if you don't like it. So no, but it's lots even of- worse. It's even worse than that, right? Because so what? It overwrote your directory, and then you like recover it. That's not a big deal. What's a big deal is that that could have been malware. So if someone decides to launch a new, hey, Bitcoiners, you get free coins. Download this wallet. You're going to get rich. You're going to see a lot of people lose a lot of money over a new attack vector because no one uses cold storage anymore because they want their airdrops, right? And there's a new attack vector being introduced into this ecosystem from these altcoin airdrop wallets and not many people know how to use virtual machines. So I had to write a tutorial on, hey, here's a free Windows virtual machine. Here's a free virtual machine software. Now you can run that new thing in its own little sandbox and whatever evil it tries to do, it's not going to screw up any of your other stuff. You know, I had to write that. The reason so I had to write that is because no one else cared. No one else cared enough to do it. I'm not a dev. Why did I have to write it? These are millions and millions and millions of dollars at risk. And I have to write it? That's very stupid. And at the time when that Bitcoin Cash launched, I assure you there was only one wallet because I went to the Wix website and I downloaded the only wallet. And then I checked to make sure that the key matched the SHA-2, the the SHA-1 or SHA-2. The signature, uh, yeah. Right. And then, you know, even that's not that secure because they could have just put a fake signature up too. So but, why are you in such a hurry on this? So like I, I haven't claimed or moved uh, almost, almost like 90 something percent of my Bitcoin Cash. I haven't touched at all. They're, they're sitting there. Because it's a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse. I don't think you should support miners leaving your favorite network. I don't think you should incentivize miners to make your network weaker. I don't think it's fair to count a market cap for a thing that most people have never touched, seen, had access to, or possibly were even told was given to them. I what if at the end of the day, Bitcoin Cash winds up providing more utility to people around the world than the, the then segment you one or two megabyte version of brand? gotten your own devs, built your own value proposition, used the same airdrop oracle method that Byteball used. And okay, hold on. Does, doesn't don't those arguments you just world. made, don't those arguments you just made apply exactly to what Blockstream have done? If they wanted to turn Bitcoin into a settlement layer and strip out the, trans, uh, the, the signatures for the transactions and make Lightning Network on top of that, shouldn't they have just started their own coin and their own branding rather than hijacking the Bitcoin project away from what was described in the original you white can, paper? You can analyze the commits in the software. The vast majority of the commits are Peter Rule. And so we basically like say Blockstream and we say Bitcoin Core, but we really mean Peter. And he so shouldn't really Peter have software. started his own project? He did. It's called Bitcoin Core and most of the nodes in the world run it. And it's been running really, really good. And the only thing that you disagree with them on are the things that some of your technicians said that you should. And let me add, like, it's very simple. What, if you what, what do you mean by the things that my technician said that I should? I, I, you lost me on If that. you go on Wikipedia and you look up big O notation, it's a fancy way of looking at how computers work with big numbers. You take a big number and you give a program this, it takes longer than the lifetime of the universe. If you change the algorithm a little bit, it takes a, like... Every time the number gets bigger, the timing gets the same amount of bigger. And you just basically get this ratio of how long does it take to how big is the stuff I'm putting in it? That's the ratio. And blocks scale linearly, right? Visa does 30,000 transactions a second before Christmas. Bitcoin does three transactions a second. So you're advocating for exponential scaling with Bitcoin, right? I am saying that big blocks could work at the cost of some extra centralization for a little while, but they would never, ever, ever work past a certain point. And then you need that different logarithmic scaling 
which Lightning gives and Tier 2 gives. And by the way, Satoshi supported those things. And I can link yeah. you to his Bitcoin and, talk. And by the way, bigger, we need Tier bigger Blocks Network supports all those things too. And in fact, if we wanted the entire world to use the Lightning Network, we would still need to have blocks that are much, 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 much bigger than they are today. So, so keeping you know the blocks do? at one megabyte is suicide for the future of Bitcoin. Pay somebody to model it, just like Gavin Anderson did, and publish it and go, hey, guys, look, you are full of crap. This does work. Here's our little AI Bitcoin user. Here's our distributed AWS nodes. And there's a lot of other testing solutions available to you where you can rent proxies and rent computers. You got a whole lot of options available to you to actually test at scale a new Bitcoin network. And then say, look, this stuff works fine. Or if you think Lightning doesn't work and you don't like onion routing, you think it's going to centralize, well, show me, right? Okay. But like, I don't think the Blockstream guys are qualified to say that big blocks couldn't work a little bit now because they probably could with some risk of centralization, which is a problem. Uh, and I don't think you're qualified to say that lightning can't work. And we both, we have them both now. So the, so the burden of proof is on them to claim that lightning can work. Whereas we already have, you know, seven or eight years of empirical evidence that right, bigger the, blocks do work. We shouldn't even argue about this stuff anymore because we have both networks, right? So the best thing I can do yeah, is like I think the argument's it. almost over. I think you're right about yeah. that. And that's yeah. the, I'm so much happier because now everybody gets to use the version of Bitcoin that they like the most. So uh, and the market will decide at the end which one is the most useful version of Bitcoin and which I, which dev I team has, has created the, yeah. the most useful product. I know we're, we're short on time. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I hope uh, it's been productive. I'll have and round useful. two someday. Whenever you're ready, um, you know, I just want to see the value of Bitcoin go up. I want to see more people in the ecosystem using the most secure most track record thing. If that becomes your thing, I don't want to call it your thing, but if it becomes I a big block become thing, thing, if it becomes a big block thing, more power to the world. I'd be more convinced Thank with data. You. All right. Well, we have the empirical evidence of the entire history of Bitcoin that the, as the blocks got bigger, more and more people were using it, and that was the, the solution. So anyhow, short on time. Thank you. I, I do look forward to having a, another edition, second edition, and right, uh, thank Everybody you, Richard. I, I appreciate it. Good talking to you, man. Later, bro. You too. See you next